idea how I'm going to talk a little more practice and then hand you back in that way. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to try and break this down to the least amount of the slides possible, so hopefully it will still hang together. So I'm a visual artist and I make work that is deliberately non-digital and it's about place and it's about walking in place and it's about using my body as a measuring tool in a place. And for the last three years, it's based on a case study of the Tor Estuary, which is in North Devon. And my initial reason for going back there and revisiting a place that I used to go to a lot as a child was that my grandmother um, lives here still. And at the time she was about to turn 100, she's now about to turn 102. And her bungalow is kind of just about on the left-hand side of that image. <coughs> Sorry, I'm battling a bit of sore throat. And she overlooks the tall estuary. So the kind of impetus for going back there was about revisiting a childhood place, revisiting walks, revisiting memories. She now has dementia, so the stories about this place are quite unreliable. And slowly through the project, it's become about creating a non-digital visual archive of the surface of this place. So it's all about the surface and materiality. Ooh. So the, the main part of the project is around using my body as a measuring tool and it's about using the repetitive acts of walking in this place. So it's about going back again and again and doing effectively the same walks over and over and over. And there's something so interesting about the idea of the kind of the use of walking as a tool to reconnect with the earth underfoot and also to have a kind of practice around um, slow movement and noticing things that when we're in cars or when we're in the many internal spaces that we inhabit, we tend to overlook, and we tend to re, we tend to lose that connection um, with the kind of smallness in the everyday. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about three works. The first is made using um, metal plates. So I use kind of adapted walking boots. You can just about see them here. And the idea um, of the plates is that they become um, a mechanism to uh, capture the weight of my body on the surface of the ground and to capture the texture of the ground. And then I collect a small bit of earth from the ground, which I then use as pigment to print with. So these are seven walks along this estuary, and they're printed with Biddeford Black, which is a pigment very particular to this place, which is a post-industrial landscape. And they used to mine a bit of black, which they used to paint the holes of the ships there. And the, 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 um, big, the last shipbuilding yard has just shut during the time that I've been walking there. So it's kind of something about capturing the specificity of the materials and the surface and my kind of repeated walks there. And along the estuary, there are these huge rusting holes of ships. And for me, they kind of represent the sort of demise of the empire and this kind of ruinous sort of man-made presence on this river. And I also kind of think that they're a symbol of what's coming our way as sea levels rise and they cover this surface that we currently have contact with. And because I can't be there all the time, I've developed something in the practice where I wear the boots to record my walks and then I carry with me metal plates and I attach these metal plates onto the rusting holes of the ships. And so they record, when I'm not there, the the effect of the weather on the ships, which is basically slowly, slowly decaying the ships and they're kind of crumbling. So there's something about this kind of ongoing recording mechanism. Oh, these look a bit funny. Okay, they shouldn't look like this. Um, they stretch for some reason. Okay, the final work um, is based around collecting the plastics that I, that I come across as I walk on the estuary. So in 2017, after Storm Brian, there was uh, yeah. a huge amount of plastics washed up on this part of the beach, which normally they're tiny, you don't really notice them. And I started that day to collect the plastics, and so now I kind of have a set of rules so that every time I walk there, I collect every piece of plastic along the way, and then I've experimented with different ways of working with them, but at the moment I'm working with photo etchings of the plastics, and there's this kind of one-to-one -one scale um, which is common throughout all of the work that I'm making, um, so that it's a kind of capturing the surface of the ground, but also capturing and working with the materiality of the objects that I come across that are very particular to this place. I'm going to leave it there and hand over.
introduce Laura Daniel, who is working site specific and often has to draw as a motif. Indeed. Throughout the process of the work that I'm currently engaged in, um, and here it is, it's uh, taken from the essay Hydrofeminism by our student Nevalis. And this, as I say, this particular paragraph is one I keep working with in lots of different ways. So here it is. As transition areas between two adjacent but different ecosystems, ecotones appear as both gradual shifts and abrupt demarcations. But more than just a marker of separation, or even a marker of connection, although importantly both those things, an ecotone is also a zone of fecundity, creativity, transformation, of becoming, assembling, multiplying, of diverging, differentiating, relinquishing. Something happens. Estuaries, tidal zones, wetlands, they are all liminal spaces where two complex systems meet, embrace, clash, and transform one another. Eco, home, tone, tension. We must all learn to be at home in the quivering tension of the in-between. No other home is available. In between nature and culture, in between biology and philosophy, in between the human and everything we run ourselves up against, everything we desperately shield ourselves from, everything we throw ourselves into, wrecked and recklessly, watching, amazed, as our skins become thinner. And while we wait for the visuals, uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the, the work I'm going to focus on talking about today, um, which is called Interim. Last winter I was able to spend five or six weeks in Bangalore working at Shrift Institute of Art and Design with a number of students um, on a project to do with the environment. And um, so we decided to focus on tanks, uh, which are lakes or reservoirs, of which there were, a generation ago, 900 in Bangalore, providing drinking water for the population. Uh, the population has grown to 12 million, but the tanks have reduced to, in number to about 90. And so the city faces a, a really imminent water crisis. In fact, for some, that water crisis is <coughs> happening right now. And so we began to explore that, first of all, by um, focusing on the lake nearest the campus, but also other lakes, there's one, for instance, that spontaneously combusts. It's so full of pollution, uh, and it hits the news quite often. And there's another one, which is one of many, which are beginning to be taken over by community groups and turned around, cleaned up, species are returning, relationships between um, the IT crowd that are moving into the new developments and the Dalit farmers that have been there for generations, they're beginning to be renegotiated by community groups so that everybody has some kind of investment in these tanks. So anyway, I had this group of students, what were we going to do? Um, we walked around these lakes using our bodies as sensory data collectors. And in some senses, that's not dissimilar to Lydia's notion of using the body as a measuring tool. But we were focusing on all our senses. So the idea was to remain silent a lot of the time so that we could listen closely. But also, when you're silent, you feel what's happening to your skin, for instance, in a very humid environment, um, and what's underneath your feet. Uh, you feel the slightest breeze, uh, which, frankly, there wasn't much of one when I was out there. Um, <laughs> and also, I think it's important to note that, you know, we were making work that was eventually going to be collaborative, um, and there, all the students that I was working with had come from different parts of India, but were completely uh, acclimatized to the climate. And I wasn't. It was their winter. It was 28 degrees. They were wearing cardigans. I was seeking shade. And so that difference in that subjective relationship to our environment is really, really important. And the focus on how we feel, I think, is a really, really important way of perhaps harnessing um, the strengths of art within the uh, dialogues and actions around climate change and the climate emergency. I think. Um, that subject of experience is crucial as a starting point. Anyway, the students and I, we went around and we came back from these walks um, talking about our sensory experiences, uh, what data our bodies had collected, and then we started to think of marks that we might make that were, um, that were abstracted, if you like, but which represented those feelings through mark making. 
So no pictures of rain clouds, hopefully. Um, uh, but um, other ways of making an expressive response through mark making to those feelings. Um, and so the students worked on that for, uh, for quite some time. And then we started to rip up the various drawings that they've done, which if any of you have worked with art students, that's actually quite difficult to get them to do. <laughs> it's my work, I'm not going to rip it up. But we got them all ripping them up um, and then sticking them back down again. I'm only showing you the one slide, which is um, absolutely fine by me because it's, I know, but they're all to do with other projects. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So back to the... Uh, so um, we ripped them up and we made, then made a collaborative map using those marks as a legend or a key to the ways we felt about these lakes and the environment that we experienced when we were walking around them. These, this collaborative map then became, became digitized and was a rolling backdrop for a performance that they did at the very end of the residency. Uh, two nights in the row, in a row. And whilst all this was going on, I was also teaching them a poem that I'd written and had translated into British Sign Language, which was uh, essentially a translation of that first paragraph I shared with you from a student named Armis about ecotones. Um, and they performed this British Sign Language poem in front of their rolling digital maps. And it was very interesting because the audience were uh, quite convinced that what the students were doing with their hands was communi communicating as if they were um, other species, as they were um, more than human others, if you like, and that they were bringing other species into the conversation about our relationship with water in the city and in, to do with the environmental crisis more generally. So it turned out to be it's one of those situations where you think you're going to be presenting one thing and the audience gets another thing from it, but through that process you learn a great deal. So, over to somebody who teaches me a great deal. No. Thank you. Um, uh, so I just wanted to um, discuss uh, very briefly a one of my projects that didn't start as a project actually. It started as a response and a response that I had to do. Um, now interesting that there's been a lot of talk around moons today because uh, I came to know uh, more deeply about this um, incinerator through um, uh, women's circling groups in Stroud. And I believe that the, the, the spiritual and the, um, uh, the sort of the, the ritual and the connection through different um, earth-centered groups is actually more and more fundamental in our um, ecological and environmental and being with, with more than human species in light of the Anthropocene. So, um, a ridiculous scenario um, of an incinerator that's been built in Gloucestershire. Today, they're actually talking about firing it up. Um, this image is coming from protests that's happening today out at the incinerator. It doesn't matter how much um, people have been protesting, doing hunger strikes, whatever, the, the, the corrupted governments um, or councils are just not giving a damn. So, it's going ahead, it would seem. Anyway, my response to this was just like, what are we doing? Why won't people listen? Um, and I spoke to Gail Bradbrook, who I know through Circling, and um, you, may, you may know she's one of the organisers of um, Extinction Rebellion. And she said, look, uh, because I, I didn't have residency at the time, so for me it was like, uh, if I get out there and protest, probably I, I get taken out of the country. Brexit will probably do that anyway. Um, but uh, she said, just do what you can. Just do what you can, Patricia. And it stayed with me, <coughs> and I just went, you know what, I'm just going to do something. I put a call out, 
and I had um, 25 artists, more than 25 artists that responded and um, across three sites I um, uh, put together this um, uh, exhibition. Now what happened, not everyone actually responded to um, the incinerator because actually the situation is beyond just one incinerator. It, it's not just about, oh, poor little Gloucestershire, although it is poor Gloucestershire. It, it's about the larger picture. So the themes that came by, came, came through this were relating to fire, to grief, to waste, to airborne particulate matter. Um, uh, and I think there was one more in there, and, and nuclear uh, uh, combustion as well. So 25 artists in Straub, I had footfall of over 500 people. People really got it and, um, and wanted to be part of it. And what I thought was really central in this was not only the, um, the, the, the work of the artists, um, which I believe people responded to on a very emotional level, but it needed to also have the activism, um, the science, um, the, the artist discussions um, as part of this, but also it needed to engage with the audience too. So, um, you know, shifting it out of the, the, the white cube was important, putting it in shops, um, and just making it as accessible as possible. Um, the first slide uh, here, Kel Portman, he runs, um, the, or he works with a group walking with the land artists, and, and their, um, uh, their interaction was to, to get out and actually work with the site um, as, uh, as walkers and artists. So, very different responses, as I said, to the call out. Um, and I've shown three up the top here that uh, were really deeply personal. Um, uh, the middle one, Karen from Kalmthal, is um, a fantasy ceramicist, but um, she's been um, in this sort of earth, earth spiritual zone for a long time. She's a successful master craftswoman in her, in her art. But her thing is really uh, mycelium and how important um, the fungal world is. And she's really developed this um, through, um, you know, participating. And I suppose, um, finally, in terms of my own um, practice, uh, what I found actually is, is a circle, back to the circling. Um, I uncovered or I found research about a deity who um, was uh, worshipped in the Iron Age. Her name is Kuda. And for me, um, finding this deity um, has been uh, a way to um, also include um, the more, more than human, um, the, the spiritual dimension to my, to my research. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. And I'd like, lastly, like to introduce Maria Niedecker, who's a professor here at the university and artist. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we call that your love. yeah I, I think I think I need to do something faster than a Petra Kucha here. I, I sort of uh, fooled myself to think I could squeeze in twenty slides, but I don't know about this. Um, I've, I've been running around conferences the last two weeks, so it's, it's sort of a, <coughs> this is the last one I think. But I, I was in Lisbon for one about plastics and all sorts of reasons to talk about plastics. I guess there was quite a lot of history anyway. And then um, in Brussels, it was all about the sort of big data and AI and now this. And I missed the discussion, so I don't know. I, I feel. I've missed out on some things. Anyway, I'll try to do this as fast as possible, and I will probably skip some. Um, yeah, I start with that image because it's got Greenland, the furthest northern point I've ever reached on there. The next thing is North Pole. And I, I suppose I'm asking myself, oops, no, click down. No, 
No, no, because it's not in. Click on there. Just, just okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 I, I just thought I'd do a very quick overview that my interests really start with looking at maps, looking at how space is represented, how we understand the space around us, the world around us, and this is one of many memory maps that I did quite a long time ago, but it really set a sort of base for my thinking about framing and understanding and perceiving everything around us. So in some way, everything that follows is based on mapping in some way, and also uh, these are sort of memory maps where I, I just ask people to draw the map of the world and then I made them into these painted maps. But then the, the, they sort of inform looking at space. I think one thing that I keep doing and in different forms is ask the viewer to sort of subjectively reassess their ability to understand what's in front of them. Um, in this case, I've made a, there's a some examples, but not many. Um, I, I sort of referred a lot to painting, where the painted space then sort of uh, expands out into three dimensions, where you circumnavigate and have to make decisions where you, where and how you're looking, I guess. And I, I kind of did quite a lot of those tank pieces, but this is probably one of the larger projects where there is um, 20,000 meters of water or something like that in this piece. And I'm totally aware there's, Everything I do involves a lot of plastic shipping, all sorts of really bad things, and I've kind of decided to stop working with plastic, but I've sort of started again. It's, it's a very difficult scenario, I find, because especially with traveling everywhere and shipping everything everywhere, it's a, it's a tricky one. And I, I sort of said to a friend the other day, what about if I just stop moving for about a year, see what happens. Um, so this is kind of really, too much to talk about, I suppose. I will try to be quicker. Important piece, that was a sort of key moment where I've expanded in scale quite a lot by having, I, I was behind one camera, but basically the piece was about setting up two cameras, working out antipodal positions of those where you could film the sunrise and set both at exactly the same time. So that was going on for about a week. I was in the Azores and I had two friends in Southeast Australia and at that point, there was no mobile phones, or there would have been no connections in those two places. So, and we had satellite phones, and it was an interesting <coughs> way to make a piece to end up with something fairly banal in terms of the images, but make something that was so specific and embracing the scale of the whole globe in, in a different way for me. And looking at landscape, of course. Um, deliberately removing all the data counters on the digital film. Um, this was made in 2001, and I've actually made quite a lot of work that seems, I mean, that's like 18 years ago. This is a sunken village in Germany. It was part of a, a sort of project around Münster where they commissioned sort of various <coughs> permanent pieces, and I suggested to drown the village, and was really shocked when they accepted the project. And I thought, oh my god, I've got to do this. So it's still there. It's kind of falling apart a little bit now. Actually, going to see it last year, um, but it was to do with it, many things. Obviously, today you read it in climate change in 100%. But it was sort of also to do with rich landowners, gardening villages in Wales, or all, all over the place. When you start looking, they do that everywhere, and um, it's kind of a significant thing. I think looking back now, and a lot of things I've done also to do with travelling from Dover to Calais and back, and making sort of photo photo stitches and things like that, which talk a lot about Brexit maybe, or in hindsight, a lot of these things make a different kind of meaning of a sense. Um, I don't know, I can play this. Oh, it didn't import the sound somehow, but anyway. This is a sort of, oh God, what have I done? <laughs> I just wanted to kick the sound off, but, um, oh dear. Um, we'll just play video and sound, by the way. No? Really? Um, anyway, I'll just skip past that. It was a sound installation on Millennium Bridge, which kind of transports you <laughs> in a different place. Um, sorry about that. I thought we could play sound, but no. it's good to know. Keep it short. <laughs> um, 
it was that one. But I'll just skip past that because without listening to the sound, it's kind of hard. Um, it was sound implanted on two points of the bridge. And then I went to Greenland to make a sculpture, which I found really difficult to make a decision to make this iceberg because it's such a cliche. Um, at the same time, it was really about framing it and about making it for a specific space and, and kind of battling with that question of uh, can you really make an iceberg? And I was really obsessed with making it as well as I possibly could. And the, the, the title is sort of talking about that in a way. The titles of all my work are quite important to me. So in some way, this, um, it, there's always something more important. It's this dilemma of the, the whole question of, do I, do I really need to fly? Do I need to drive? Yes, I need to bring my kids to, to, to school, to this, to that. Um, there's a lot of questions that could be more important to do one or the other thing. So in a way, often the work is exactly about that sort of borderline between two decisions and two interpretations and those kind of things. And this photo is relevant in the sense that I made the sculpture exactly to the size of the door that the first door it went through. Um, so it was like five millimeters all the way around to fit into this architecture of a human space. So in a way, often this question of a landscape or piece of nature fitting into a human context. Um, just to, I don't even know, it's probably very bleached, but it's always hard to capture the quality of this, this iceberg. Now, if I can't show video, then it's really difficult to, no, it doesn't show. That's a shame. Anyway, I was going to show you some deep sea under, under, under sea pieces, but they are moving images. So this is just the context in a way. I didn't use this as an image for the work, but I had long conversations with the deep sea mar marine biologist in Oxford. Um, Alex Rogers has worked with, I mean, I've worked with him. He's worked with me. We've worked together <laughs> quite a while. It's strictly speaking, again, it's not really collaborative, it's just we exchange information. He gives me video, um, we go to science conferences together, science and art, and give talks together. So it's kind of, that's where the level of the audience, where the audience meets the piece functions. The work itself then would be separate. He's been amazing in giving me footage of various projects. Again, I can't activate this because it's a film. but. Um, it's a lot to do, again, with this perception of going under, going under the water, of losing sight, invisibility, um, sinking down into the darkness, yet having a uh, torchlight, etc. Shame, so I can't show you that film. Anyway, you sort of get the idea. I think it's probably quite good that I can't show you all these films, but um, now it's just a, the few pieces where I've worked with forests in different ways. Um, I've made tank pieces where a smaller scale would be sort of submerged in water. This is life size. It was a sort of test really to see what happens if I cast a section of a forest and go completely overboard with detail and make it sort of hyper real. Um, which was a specific commission for a permanent installation, obviously. I don't think that would move very fast. Um, but I was getting really carried away with cutting pine cones and things like this in order to sort of talk about the relationship of humans to that space and humans looking at landscape. And with all these things, I think it, it is landscape I'm looking at rather than nature. There's always some evidence of humans, um, little stairs or a path or a can or a mast or something always in those things. Um, now this is tricky again because there's a film attached with this. Um, this is a commission for Guy's Hospital New Cancer Centre in London, which is permanent and it's in the lifts. And this image is just sort of trying to illustrate, I guess, that I drew a parallel between the building itself and the rainforest and wanted to sort of allow the visitors, the patients, the family uh, to, in the lift, experience this kind of space um, vertically, where you have a choice to press different heights, obviously, depending if you go for treatment or whatever, um, that the image of the video moves up with the lift. So you kind of know what height you are every time sort of synchronized. So this sort of tracking of landscape has become 
sort of something I've been doing quite a few times, not just landscape, but also other things and animals and in CERN and everywhere I go I seem to do tracking shots at the moment because it's an interesting way to sort of change the, perce the, the perception of space and can't see the film which is a shame but you can actually you could if you were interested go into the cancer center it's a clinic it's not a hospital so people are allowed to go and travel in the lifts if you behave <laughs> Um, this is the last piece I think I'm just going to show you, which has just come down in Dulwich, which is sort of going back to earlier pieces in some way, but it was such an appropriate piece to make for the challenge of <coughs> making something for the Howard Zorberg exhibition to respond to his <coughs> paintings, which are very bright in colour. He's a Norwegian painter. Um, some of you might have seen this, I don't know. It was in the mausoleum and to also respond to the space itself. And I ended up making this very yellow, because the light in the mausoleum is incredibly yellow, I made this sort of yellow, slightly toxic forest, which is of course open to interpretation. Um, I suppose, and then the world changed color, was, was again, often the titles come out from radio, bits of information, bits of interviews, and. I think they were talking about Trump. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, last image. Again, I would have liked to show you that as a film, the um, cosmic dust, but never mind. You have to just imagine it, but I'm doing a lot of work currently with CERN, and um, it's, it's quite a bizarre film, but I'm not using the cosmic dust for a piece of work. I, I do something quite different. I felt that the, the way the Anselm Kiefer notes are quite appropriate what we're talking about as well. And I shall leave it there. Thank you. And thanks everybody on the panel. I'm very aware of the time, so I'm going to, on the subject of cosmic dust, magic moons, we'll maybe just go to one question that we can pose to the panel and see how we go and maybe extend that out. Further, which is really, can art reach audiences deeply enough to engage a society actively, and should it? So I'll just close that round for a As a I've already forgotten the question now. <laughs> no, no, I'm happy to say something. I just, I wouldn't want it to be quite specific, but. Uh, well, of course it can. I mean, in some way, it's something I, I, I do think art is like a sort of window or mirror, or it's, it's, that, it's slightly cliche, but it's very true that you sort of hold up a mirror or a window to another world, but it's, it's this kind of reflective um, screen that, that can be quite upsetting, if you, if you, especially if it amplifies what humans are doing. And it's, it's often very abstract, I think. And this is maybe something I'm often shying away from, partly because I travel too much, I've got kids and all the rest of it, that I, 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 quite, I think art has a sort of big job to do to shift perceptions and do things like that. I'm not totally sure about the sort of specificness of political agendas that art needs to sort of flag up. But it has been done brilliantly. And I mean, this morning we've seen some really fantastic examples. So. Um, it's just, I'm just speaking for myself. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, shall I pass this around? Um, we had, I think this links back to the conversation we had in our group actually, that I sort of feel this tremendous guilt that I'm just putting, making more stuff and putting more stuff in the world. And like you, I feel like, yeah, I feel uncomfortable about that. Um, but I also think that it can have the possibility of opening up questions having conversations and um, and through the idea of it being a mirror, kind of placing a line in the sand and saying this is where we are, we are, what actions can we come to collectively for the future. So I think there's some hope within it, but I think it, it, it can be kind of problematic when you just think about how we make stuff and what, what happens with that stuff going into the world, etc. Et I suppose uh, I think that um, art can do, I've uh, sort of forgotten how you phrase the question, I'm sorry. Can art reach audiences and engage deeply in art as well? Can we engage society actively and engage with them? And should it be? Should art have that phrase? I guess.
guess I would always resist the should word. Um, um, it doesn't mean to say that it shouldn't, but um, the idea that that's its purpose, um, I think, is, is um, would be limiting. Um, it's one of many purposes that it might, or functions that it might have. Um, and I think, yes, art does engage people deeply. Um, I mean, in all sorts of ways, whether that be the visual arts that we've been showing today or the wonderful music we heard earlier, um, and the creativity of the um, two speakers from France, uh, from the Z, that, Catherine. The, the amount of creativity in that particular um, lived example of disobedience and radical action was phenomenal, in my opinion, and was extraordinarily artistic and creative in ways that artists often aren't. So there you go. Um. Yeah, just reflecting back on my own experience, I think that art is really important um, to keep the conversation going as well because activism often um, it doesn't work or you know you have to keep, keep at it, keep at it and sometimes there's moments where it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere for whatever reason and so art is able, I think, to, to hold that discussion and to affect people um, emotionally, um, but also logically as well. There's, there's um, I think, a, a strong logic within art too. So. Thank you, thank you. And I really like to thank the panel for, I know it's been a much more condensed uh, time than you might well have had, but there's been some real amazing touchstones of diverse artistic practice that you shared, and I think what you've just spoken of really speaks and echoes of some of the aspects we've had in the themes of the symposium today. So I'd really like to thank you again for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Are there any more just before we sort of round up? Are there any questions, any, anything, any comments that anyone wants to make? Okay. Um, thanks again to all our speakers and contributors, and particularly all of you who stayed the course. And I'd really like to extend a last thank you to both Judith and Rachel. And Rachel. It really made it today. Uh, success. The only thing I think I can respond in relation to the last question Judith asked and the really engaging, wonderful work we've just seen is to finish on a quote from Joseph, or an idea from Joseph Boys, and I God hope I'm not wrong because there are some voice experts in the room. So, but he said that um, to make people free is the aim of art, and for me, Art is the science of freedom, and that is enough to say whether or not we should be uh, standing up for whether we should be able to make work that uh, engages in issues or not. It's about freedom, and I think we can kind of leave it there. <laughs>